What up, YouTube? It's time to brew some beer. So uh, what I'm brewing today is a Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown Ale. I made this one before in October. It was a uh, seasonal thing. I wanted to do something pumpkin-y. I was a little worried that it might be too pumpkin flavored because I don't like pumpkin flavored ales, but it turned out awesome. So I'm making it again. Fairly simple recipe, basic grain bill. If you want that, just hit me up in the notes. There's only bittering hops added, one hop addition, and then the pumpkin spice you put with five minutes left in the boil. I got my yeast started going. I started this uh, yesterday afternoon. I've had it going out light. It's been really active, but I started using yeast starters on all my beers. If you're not making yeast starters, go ahead and start, because it used to be I would pitch, and then I might start seeing fermentation within 24 hours. The last brew that I did with the yeast starter, I pitched it, I was seeing fermentation within a couple of hours that night. I mean, just really, really bubbling. So I would recommend yeast starters if you haven't tried one, they're really easy to make. Just YouTube it or Google it and the recipe is pretty simple. All right, let's check out the new brew house. All right, so this is the latest version of my brew setup. I am slowly progressing towards trying to do a all electric system. So I don't have to keep dragging the propane tanks in here, working with all the, the excess heat, and uh, just to streamline this. I want to go to, to a two-pump system, uh, F, you know, three vessel, one level. But as I build towards that, um, I'm trying not to duplicate any gear. I'm trying to make sure everything that I buy, I can use in the final product. So to talk you through the new system that I got here. Right now we are bringing water up to temperature. I Using these quick disconnects for everything, it makes it really easy when you got to change the flow. The next version I'll be putting in three-way valves once I get a table set up and kind of iron out exactly how I want this thing done. Caught liquid tank, um, and you see I got a coil in here that I bent. It was bigger than it needed to be to fit in this pot, so I bent it. I got a couple of kinks, not major, they're not restricting the flow too much because it does work well, but it was a lot of work to do this in stainless steel. So in here I've got my my old mash tun, you see I got some grains here from the batch I just did before this, because I just quick rinse that. This has a false bottom in it. My boil pot, which I've also put a whirl whirlpool system in here for when I put in the immersion chiller. I just use these in the pump to swirl, cools off the wort much, much quicker than just sitting that in there. And it's a lot easier than sitting in stirring the wort for the cooling period. So step one, once this water gets up to temperature, I'm gonna throw my grains in, and then I'm gonna do a recirculation mash the entire time, pulling out of here, going through the pump, in through the coil, using the temperature of this water to maintain the mash temperature, and then just kind of dripping it in here. Twofold, it keeps this temperature steady, it allows you to change this temperature for when I mash out, I can increase the temperature here and I can mash out, which is this one has a mash out of 168. And it also filters your wort the entire time. So real, real clean final product going into the boil. temperature sitting right at 152 I found with my system if this is at 154 it keeps this right at 152 so the next order of business is to get this to 154 so we can start recirculating and just hold this at 152 uh, I'm gonna put some cold water in here but as of now we are mashed in as soon as we get the temperatures lined up the way we want or once I get the temperatures lined up the way I want then I'm gonna start the recirculation pump and I'll show you the flow that we have going there so we're at, uh, we're at 154 in the hot liquid tank, 152 in the mash ton. Now I just let this recirculate for the course of the mash. It'll hold temperature, um, kick this flame on and set it really, really, really low. The nice thing about having a large body of water here is it takes a while for it to change in temperature. So it's gonna hold temperature pretty good, even if with no heat on it, it's gonna hold this temperature pretty good. But we are gonna kick it on just to make sure it maintains over the next 45 minutes to an hour. And I'll show you the flow rate we got going here. That's about it. 
Um, there. So that's it. That's the recirculation rate I go at. Maybe sometimes a little bit higher, but just enough to keep everything moving. You see down here, this thing is barely open. So we've been recirculating our mash for an hour now. Hold the temperature at 152, 154 on the water using the Herms coil. Um, timer's about to kick off. The second step of this is going to be our mash out. So we're going to mash out. We're going to bring this up to 168 over a 10 minute period, give or take. So I'm just going to start bringing up the temperature. All right, so we got this up to uh, 168. Took a little bit longer than anticipated, but hey, it is what it is. You can't rush a brew. Um, we're actually sparging with 200 degree water in this one. So I'm bringing this up to 200. We're at 195, so not too much further. Bring this up to 200. And then what I'm going to do is redo my plumbing. Instead of pulling off of here, I can actually set this up right now. So for the sparging process, I'm going to draw directly from the hot liquor tank and then drain into the boil kettle. The Sparge process for this particular recipe calls for a 60 minute sparge. I do not have that level of patience. And with, if I had an automated system, if I had an auto sparge arm, I would do this in 60 minutes. The problem is the way I've got a sparge, I basically have to try and tweak these two dials between the pump and the drain to keep the level in it so that it's sparging correctly. It's real hard to do that. It takes constant monitoring and if it's slightly off and we're 60 minutes, it's either going to put in too much water or it's going to drain completely and just be running a trickle of water through it. So I usually shoot for about a 30 minute process just to kind of cut back on that a little bit but still get the same effect. Once I switch to an electronic system, I'll probably put in an auto sparge arm so that I can do these long sparges and uh, not have to deal with messing with these valves all the time. But for now, this is what I got. All right, so we're at 200. So we're going to cut the flame. The plumbing is set up to start the sparge. But before we start the sparge, we got to do some housekeeping. So I need to get this under there so that during the 30 minutes, I don't have to wait a full 30 minutes with my work cooling before I can start prepping for the boil. So now I can start my sparge. seven gallons is my pre-boil volume that I'm shooting for. So I'm going to use my mass and measuring tool. And as soon as I hit 6.7, or when I start getting close, I'm going to cut off the pump and try and drain all the fluids, as much of those sugars and out of the uh, mass as I can to hit my final boil volume, the pre-boil volume. Now this system, um, the way I've got this set up, this pot, my boil rates, the area I'm in, I use the Beersmith app to calculate out my pre-boil volume because I'm trying to have 5.25 gallons going into the fermenter. I get about a quarter gallon loss in fermentation. Shooting for a five gallon batch for the keg, you need the math. So now we're gonna let this slowly run over the next 30 minutes or so until we hit our pre-boil volume. This just helps to protect the rubber gaskets on here from direct heat. Now that I've got a little bit run in here, I can go ahead and kick on the flame and uh, start heating this up so the boil doesn't take me as long to get to boil. So we're at six gallons. We need to run off 6.7 for the, pre for the uh, proper volume of the boil. I cranked up my heat to get the boil going. I've slowed my uh, sparge water to just a trickle, just enough to keep some water in there. And then 
I'm probably going to get about a half an hour on the plane to pop this completely to just try and drain all the moisture from the bag. Right, so we got five minutes left in the boil. At this point in time, I always turn up the flame to keep a good rolling boil during the last couple of additives. We're going to add the uh, pumpkin spice. That stir. That's that last bit of flavor. I have my wort chiller. And this is just to sanitize it. So we're almost done with our boil. Two things I'm going to do here. One, I'm going to cut the gas and put the uh, pull the hot bag out of there, just to get out of the way and let it drip in there for any last flavors and fluids and stuff like that to stay within the, the work. And then after that, I am going to move it over here so that I can start the chilling process. And there we go. Why I use a swirl, it just makes the chilling process much more efficient. And it's easier than sitting here with a spoon and stirring this. Talk about the importance of aeration. Yeah, read this. That's it. I'm going to seal this up. Take a uh, specific gravity reading prior to the, before I pitch the yeast. Once some of these bubbles kind of clear down and I can at least get in there and, and I use pressured air to clear away from the hydrometer, I can get a pre-fermentation reading and then I'm gonna pitch the yeast, put a, attach a blow off and let it go. All right, so these guys have finally finished their fermentation. I did two batches, one, one day after the other. I got the uh, Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown Ale there on the left and then my Blue Moon clone on the right. Both these guys have fermented out completely so they're ready to be kegged. Um, I'm using this uh, cooling method to monitor my fermentation temperature, basically filling a bathtub with water. We'll hold this around 71 degrees as opposed to having it fluctuate with the room temperature as your heat kicks on and kicks off, AC kicks on and kicks off. It's, uh, it's a stopgap solution until I can get a refrigerator where I can hook it up to a temperature controller and actually keep these guys at a constant temp temperature during fermentation. So I'm sanitizing all my stuff here. I got two kegs, getting them sanitized with star sand. I got my spray bottle for any anything that I touch with my hands that I want to sanitize or the tops of these things. Um, the hoses, I put these inside. I suck some star sand through them to get the inside and then I shake it up inside the kegs to get the outside all sterilized. Once it goes in here, then we're gonna pressurize it at uh, 25 PSI and let it sit and just force carbonate over time. Now this is a wine siphon, so it's a plastic tube. It's got a, it's corked at the bottom, and then it's got a hole about that far up. The idea is that it doesn't pick up any of the garbage that's on the bottom. These finished out right about where I wanted them to. The, the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown Ale was supposed to finish out at 1.011, and that's exactly where it hit. When I started, I was 0.002 high in the specific gravity, so we got a little bit more alcohol, but the flavor should be spot on. The Blue Moon, that one started out 0.002 high on specific gravity when I put it into the fermenter. And our final gravity, we were looking for the same thing, 1.011, we ended up at 1.013. So we mathematically, we are right at where we should be for the actual alcohol content on that beer. I'm going to crank my regulator up to 25 PSI. And that's what I use for forced carbonation. And all this stuff has already been spritzed and sterilized. And you can hear it jamming right there. So here we go. Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown Ale. Turned out about a 4.4% alcohol um, ABV, and um, which is a little bit lower than the recipe is actually supposed to be. But the flavor turned out fantastic. Yeah, 
If you guys don't like real pumpkin-y beers, you still might like this. I don't like pumpkin-y beers, but I like this one. It's really just a hint of pumpkin spice. You saw from the recipe, you're not putting in that much. It's really just a hint of pumpkin spice. But this is good to go.